Okay, so we're in the third video now of our getting started beginner session with uh, data factories, data flows, and we're really rolling now. We've had our data flow that we've built where we're doing the aggregation, so we're doing some analytics on it. I want to do one more thing because it's very common that you'll want to also use derived columns within your data flow. Derived columns is a way to write expressions that you can then create computed columns, you can extract data do things of that nature. Very, very common. Now remember, in our data flow, we're doing our two aggregations using the self-join to bring the data back together after the aggregates, and then we're landing the data into our data warehouse. Our data warehouse is uh, essentially going to rewrite. We have no defined schema in here. So in our settings, what we've said is that we're going to allow inserts, and that we're going to recreate the table. So whatever ha we happen to come up with as our schema is going to land into a data warehouse. It doesn't matter if you want to add more columns. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll just add more stuff in here. So we have our cleanup, which is getting rid of the duplicate fields. Remember, we self-joined to get the data back, the original metadata after the aggregations. So we have to click on here, which says to remove the duplicate columns. Let's go after that, and let's add a derived column now into our flow. So we're going to just snap this in here. We're going to do a derived column. And here what we're going to do is we go back to what the data looks like. Uh, let's go back to the step right before this new transformation, the derived column. We'll go ahead and refresh this. What we're going to see is that we have a column in here. We have a couple of different things that, that we can do, and I'll do both of these in one single step to show you how you can work within a derived column. And this is going to be, uh, we're going to take the uh, uh, name, we're going to concatenate that, and we're also going to take out and extract out the the state abbreviation from the location. So here is the address location. So after the comma, we have a space, then a two states abbreviation. So we'll go um, up to the comma, and then we'll split on that. And then we'll take the last part of that. We'll take the second half of that string. And then we have last name and first name. So let's concatenate those and create a full name field. So in drive column, let's first do this. the uh, full name. We'll do that first. So we'll say a new field. Right, I can modify. You can also pull this down and modify existing fields. That's not what we're doing here. We want to generate two new fields. The first one is going to be full name. Let's go into the expression builder. We can do, okay, so we're in our full name com column. Now remember, I also said that we wanted to create a second one. So we can just click plus over here on the left-hand side and add another column. This one we will call as, um, this is going to be the state of view here. So we'll say states. Let's call it state. That should be fine. All right, let's go back and we'll do. We'll work on full name first. Now we can write an expression over here with all the functions and the expression language that are available to us. So the full name is just going to be a concat. So all we have to do is we can either just add, or we can use the uh, concats uh, for strings and for concat ws is for concat with separator. But what I'm going to do is real simple. I'm just going to take the. We'll go with the actual uh, full name this way. So we'll say a full name. We can just say plus. Put a space in between that and just click on last name. That's a pretty simple formula. Now let's build the formula for states. A little bit more complex. We have to first split. So we're going to split on location. And then we have the comma separator in there. Now you can get further help on the uh, functions over here by putting it into the help. And then we have a whole set of examples. So the um, the function signature does have characters for the split, so I'm actually going to say comma space on that. And then I'm going to use the array syntax to get the second element, so the second set of the splits. And let's go ahead and let's do a refresh on this. You can actually, uh, you can look at the results of your logic, your uh, formulas right here within the expression below. You don't even have to leave it. Just click refresh and so we can see if we're getting the right data. And yep, that looks uh, close enough. So we do have these in here. I'm not going to worry about that uh, for this simple example. And then let's take a look at full name, make sure full name has the results that we're looking for. So we'll click up here onto full name. And I'll click refresh on that. And that looks plenty good. I think that we're all set. All right, now let's go ahead and sync. So let's go back to our mapping. We're going to have to just update the this, I'm not doing uh, auto mapping. I don't want all of these columns, but I do need to add now the new column that we created. Uh, I think there's other stuff. So we can take out the last and first name, and we'll just add in down here, we'll add in full name. So we'll have that in our drop down now. And we'll call it full name in the database. And then the other one is the um, state. We'll call that a state in the database as well. Good enough. So now we can save this. We can validate and make sure everything is valid. 
and we are indeed good. Now let's go over to a pipeline. So back in our pipeline now, we can actually execute this and we can write the data under debug. We have our debug session on, so we can use that debug cluster. We are using the uh, mapping data flow and we can click the debug button here. This will now run end to end everything we just built. And it's going to run that uh, against the live data and it will also write that into the target database. Now you can also, this is going to run against the entire data set and there's just a few rows now. It's not a big data set. But I do want to show you is that, let me actually bring this down a little bit. Is that you can go into your source if you want to debug that against a subset of data. There is a there is a source setting where you can say to just sample. If you click sampling enabled, you can limit the number of rows that it's during debug and it may be helpful to you, but we don't need to do that here for this simple example. Okay, so we're gonna let this run. This should take a little bit more than a minute. Uh, we can take a look at how we're doing right here so far. And we have um, the cluster took about 13 seconds to set up the job. So we are right now in the process we have about about 25, 75 rows going through the entire um, stream. And we are done. Okay, so it took about, so yeah, this is already completed. So now that means we can go into our database and we should see, we refresh this and show that it's done, good. We can go to our database, we should see a schema called dbo.radio. And let's go ahead and refresh dbo.radio. All right, so there's our timestamp status. This All right, so looks like we have our new uh, table schema. It then looks like it's there. We've got our original data. We have the aggregations. We have the new full name and the new state data. So everything is great. Now that we're done testing, now we can go ahead and operationalize this. And you do that by creating a trigger. Now, remember what I said earlier on the first video in this series, which is that uh, we're in Git mode, so everything is saved, but it's all within Git. We need to publish this now, this now out to the service before we can schedule it. So the next thing we need to do is to publish. So you click this button up here to publish, and this will take what you've done in Git, and this will push us out to the live service. Let's give this a minute to uh, make its way out. We, it's going to show us all the changes that were made uh, from this branch. And I'm fine with all those. We're going to have those now published out to the live service. Once this is done, now we can make a trigger for it. And I'll do that just by doing a, a trigger now on it to demonstrate what that looks like. But while that's cooking in the background, this might be a good time for me to show you what happened on that uh, run. So the total execution of creating that, of so generating that data flow was a minute and four seconds, the execution time. If you click on the eyeglasses, you can see the full detail of that that we were looking at earlier, which was the live execution of the um, of the flow. But if you go back into that, you can see the, uh, the history of it. So. Uh, we have, see the number of rows that were transformed, how long it took, how long the cluster time took. If you click on the sync, you'll see how long the I.O. took to actually write that into SQL Data Warehouse, and that was 11 and a half seconds or so. We only used one partition, and that's great because we didn't have a lot of data. So if we had tried to partition this data, it would have really split that data out. If you want to learn more about partitioning, go into some of the other videos I have around optimizing using the optimization capability of partitioning within um, data flows. But you can also see I didn't mean to close that. You can also see in here is the um, lineage back on the sync. You can see, for example, that let's take the, um, a good example would be the state field. You can see the lineage of that was, it was calculated from the location field. Or that the aggregate, the subs by location, that was also calculated uh, through an aggregation. So you can see the lineage of your data from this view. So to trigger this from a trigger now, a couple of things we have to do. This is going to be an operationalized run, which means that every time that this activity executes, it's going to execute against the, inter the Azure integration runtime definition of what size cluster you want to use for your compute environment. So I'm just going to use a small cluster because I don't have a lot of data in here, but I do want that cluster to be around and be active so that I don't have to wait for it to uh, to acquire the resources. If you don't have a warm cluster, it'll take about five to six minutes for that cluster to spin up. You can cut that time in half by having a warm cluster, but to do that, you need to go into the settings I showed you in the first video. Let's go to that small cluster. You need to set a time to live. So in this case, I have a time to live just 10 minutes. This is a very small cluster. It's using Compute Optimize, which is a uh, inexpensive model of uh, cluster to use. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a cluster of Databricks VMs that can be leveraged within that 10 minute time period. So it'll just have to acquire the VM and then execute your job in that period of time. Now, however, that cluster has to already be warm, right? So when I run this for the first time, 
it'll take five to six minutes to execute that. Now, let me show you, I can show you that by doing this. Let me take one of these data flows that I've done here. Let me actually add another one right next to it. And we'll just call the exact same data flow. Okay. Now what you'll see when we run this is that the first one will take the time to acquire the entire pool for you. The second one will run much faster because it's already had an established pool. So you can use um, mechanisms to, to warm up a pool of resources to make every subsequent run run what execute much faster within that TTL period that you've set. Let's go ahead and make sure that we use the same. You have to use the same Azure IR though for this to work. So we can use the same one here. Actually, let me show you that here as well. Another trick you can do is you can just go ahead and just warm that up at the beginning of the day with a pipeline. So I'll just do it in the same pipeline, but you want to you would want to do this in a different pipeline. I have just sort of a dummy um, data flow called warm cluster. It doesn't do anything. It has a filter, I'll show you right now, but has a filter transformation in it that just says one is equal to two. So whatever source you have, no data is ever going to flow through here because one is never equal to two. I just have a single derived column that says nothing, and I just map that single column to a file. Right? So very, very simple, just that it gets in and out real quick in less than a minute. So what happens is you use that time to spin up that, that cluster. So this cluster is, again, going to be defined from small cluster. So we'll do these all in sequence. Okay, so we just need to make sure that we have published all these changes that we just made to our uh, pipeline because we are running this pipeline from the uh, trigger mode. All right, so there we go. So now let's go ahead and we will trigger this now and let's see what we get. And I'm going to allow this to execute for a few minutes and then come right back to you. All right, so I am back and I am on my monitor view. So I clicked on the monitoring button icon on the left-hand side and on the monitoring view. Let me actually go back to the pipeline so you can see some of the other runs I've had throughout the day. Now, when I click on the one that we just ran here, you can see that we have those three um, activities that I have in my pipeline. The first one is just warming up the cluster. So notice how the warm cluster data flow doesn't really do anything. It just gets your cluster warmed up. That takes 6 minutes and 15 seconds. That is pretty much all, uh, primarily all, um, startup time with the Databricks uh, service. So the uh, there's about maybe a minute or so of actual execution, but it doesn't really do anything, uh, not really uh, performing data flows. Now each subsequent activity is using that same defined Azure IR. In this case, I called it um, small cluster. And you can see that each one of those then takes um, half that time if not less, to execute because the cluster acquisition time is so much lower because it's using a pool of resources now available to it. So this is a pattern to use when you're in production to minimize the startup time of your data flow activities. You can click on the icons here, these, these eyeglass icons, and you can see the details of what was going on. So here's our entire data flow again. And you can see that the uh, cluster acquisition time was only a minute and 38 seconds to uh, start up that um, data flow activity. And then on the first initial execution, it was five minutes. So that's pretty much walks you through end to end of building a data flow, uh, an ac activity for it, so running from the pipeline, monitoring, and getting started with the different transmissions we have. Uh, so thanks for watching.